even though we're in a region of four million people, very few are aware of the fact that we've got a really nationally significant conservation area nestled in the midst of the Washington metro region. And that is the Potomac Gorge, which is a 15 mile river corridor from just above Great Falls down to Georgetown. Within the area that we call the Potomac Gorge is about a 10,000 acre core conservation area. But of course that area is affected by everything that occurs upstream in the Potomac watershed, all 11,000 square miles upstream of the gorge and even a lot of what happens downstream because this part, the lower part of the gorge is actually tidally influenced. And there's some large migratory fish species that actually divide their life cycle between the gorge, which is their spawning reproduction area, and the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean and the eastern seaboard. When we're thinking about the gorge and resource management, we really have to think about a broader area of the larger Potomac watershed out to the bay to the Atlantic seaboard. I feel a sense of ownership of the place. Like, this is my city, this is my region, this is my river, and this is my waterfall. <laughs> you know. It's a resource that, that, that we rely on in so many ways. For, for our water supply and for aesthetic values, for just sort of that spiritual sense of, of this great, powerful force that is there that responds to nature, responds to drought, responds to storm, responds to hurricane, responds to snow melt, and it kind of reminds us of our place. When we pulled together a lot of information, both from research and literature and expert consultations, we found that there are some really extraordinary features of this area that make it unlike any place else that are really worthy of deeper investment in their protection and management. The first of those are some groups of vegetation that actually occur along the river corridor. There's um, riparian or riverside natural communities, groups of vegetation that get flooded very frequently. And, some unusual assemblages of plants and a really tremendous diversity of rare plants in that riparian zone. In one random plot that was put down, a 400 meter square plot that was put down at Chain Bridge, uh, a botanist counted the greatest number of plant species anywhere ever recorded east of the Mississippi. So it's pretty extraordinary from a regional perspective as well. So the first area of threats that we're concerned with is actually that related to invasive non-native species, which is a huge problem both here in the gorge and around the country and around the world. In fact, uh, an analysis of federally listed species in the United States by our partner group called NatureServe showed that invasive species are the second greatest threat to biological diversity in the country after habitat loss and fragmentation. This very faint green, um, just starting grass. This is called Japanese stilt grass. This is one of the top three bad invasive non-native species that occurs here. And you'll see it once you get like a search image for it. It can really just blanket the, um, the, the forest floor and really outcompete other species for that growing space. It's a big problem here. Um, I think that it was introduced as a packaging, a crate, like a, to cushion things in packing crates. That's what I've been told. As just like not styrofoam and natural sort of. How long has it been here? Um, it started to arrive in the last 15, 20 years, also and it's like really, it's, brand new, it's relatively new. To help me out, so like this is cheap stick out on both sides. So one of our objectives in the gorge is to really s slow the spread and the introduction of new invasive non-native species, which move into an area spread like wildfire and really can outcompete native species for growing space and in some cases really threaten the survival of some rare plants in some of these unusual natural communities that we have. One of the major issues that we face in the Potomac River Gorge is that of surrounding land use and development, which is not surprising given the fact that we're in a region of some four million people and it's a very long, thin conservation area so there's a lot of porous borders and a lot of ability to have impacts from the surrounding land use, both to water quality, both in terms of spread of invasive species that come in from beyond park boundaries, and then of course related to just the overall impact of, of all the visitors who come that, um, that 
the cumulative impact of many feet on, on sensitive habitats has. But we're trying to really reach out and help raise awareness in the local communities about what a special and significant place this is and what some of the threats are and how individual landowners can choose to make differences with how they manage their yard and their home that are compatible with some of our objectives to try to help perpetuate these really special resources in the area. So together with our partner group, the Potomac Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy is working on developing what we call the Good Neighbor Handbook, which is subtitle is a river friendly guide to living in the Middle Potomac region. And the purpose of this handbook will be to provide sort of an introduction to some land management practices that individuals can easily take at their own home, in their own garden, that are compatible with conservation. And we have a section on uh, habitat enhancement for wildlife and how planting native species can help enhance habitat value in your own backyard. And uh, it's another section on rain barrels and capturing rainwater through various channels that then can be used for various purposes around, around the yard and around the house rather than just being shunted as stormwater straight into storm drains and straight into the bay carrying all the pollutants that, uh, that stormwater can carry. We have a section on, on lawn use as well, and uh, not lawn use, lawn care rather, and ways to uh, minimize the impacts of chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers from being washed into our waterways, which then can cause fish kills and also kill other animals lower in the food chain and have ripple effects throughout the ecology of our aquatic systems. I think different people choose to live in this region for different reasons. Some people like the thrill of being in the nation's capital where power centers are. Some people come for job opportunities, some come for other personal opportunities or, or family reasons. And for me, one of the reasons I've chosen to stay here for the years that I've been here is because I find it livable. And that's because of the wonderful green infrastructure that we have, that we have access to the CNO Canal, to the Billy Goat Trail, to Bear Island, to Potomac Gorge and, and we are linked up. We can bike our, to work if we want to on certain green trails that provide access and safe ways to get to work without using fossil fuels. And it really is a tremendous resource. And I think ultimately it comes down to uh, decisions that we each make as individuals, as, as families, as communities, and as a society of how we want to see this region continue to, to grow and change over time and there are different alternatives and there are different models and uh, it's I think important for all of us to to recognize the values that we get that we have this basic life support system from our our green infrastructure from our open space our rivers our streams the air that we breathe and, and it's really hard to put a value on that but as a, as a society I think that really needs to be factored into policy making decisions how do you replace your drinking water supply how do you address all of the asthma and health complaints when there are ozone days when the pollutants are too high and we have those frequently in the summertime here in DC. So the question is how we choose to value these resources and how we choose to convey to policymakers and elected officials that they are important to us and how we can shape our future. Since I've been working in the conservation field I have progressively gone from working at a larger scale to a smaller scale. My first work was working on an international level doing conservation work in Africa. Then I was working at a national level in the US and now finally I feel like I've really found my home by working at home, by working on the area that is my backyard, this Potomac Gorge area. And there's a certain sense of satisfaction of being able to really delve in deeply on this one area where a team of 10 could spend a whole career working on this area and still be left with so much to learn. And it's just, a, it's fascinating how once we slow down and really look closely at an area, how much we can learn if we just give ourselves the time and have the luxury of that time to get to know it well. And, and our appreciation, I think, grows exponentially the more intimately we get to know a place.